I had some when I was a kid. Um, I had some kind of issues. I, I don't know exactly what they were, but uh-huh. my, I was in some at the two one thirty four interchange. There was like a hospital there, and I was, my mom had me in there doing intensive therapy. When you were a kid? Yeah, it was like dyslexia, right, left, confusion, balance uh-huh. issues, all, and different language difficulties. They couldn't figure out what it was, though? Or yeah, did you get diagnosed? I had some di- – I don't know what the exact diagnosis was, and, uh-huh. but my brain had to learn new ways of doing certain things. Wow. And, like, well, and I still, like, you know, do certain letters backward. You know, I mean, they're uh-huh. the right way. It's just I don't – I do them the whatever way. Right, but not like textbook dyslexic. No. Yeah. But you must have been a good student, dude. You went to Harvard, so you uh, figured it out somehow. Yeah, yeah, no, I did. But I mostly read and just like was kind of learned on my own and uh-huh. could kick a football really far. I think like, soccer was my passion and then cross over into football and got recruited into different colleges. Oh, wow. So did you, yeah. you play football at Harvard? Yeah, for two years. You did? Yeah. What, you, were, uh, you were the kicker? Yeah, I kicked from nine, well, 91 and 92. And then, but I got a little bored because uh-huh. like, soccer was my life. And, right. Um, my friends were playing rugby and having a lot more fun. Uh, it was it was an NCAA. Yeah. And it just kind of blended more of my skill set. Plus, there was no drug testing for uh-huh. cannabis, which was an increasing, <laughs> increasingly important dimension. It's problematic for you, know, you, man. I'm like, dude, not yeah. another fall season, man. I have a hard time visualizing <laughs> you in a football uniform, though. I wouldn't have yeah. thought that. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, no, it was, yeah. And, you know, and it just got less fun, you know, uh-huh. like just the four hour practices day in, day out. I hear you, brother. Yeah. It's work, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to make sure I was playing a sport I was a lot more passionate about. Uh-huh. Than, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed, I, I played tight end in high school, but I wasn't good enough to play at that mm-hmm. level. You're a big and, dude, right? Like, what are you, like six, six or something? Six, six five? four and a half. Six, four. Four. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You're a tall dude. Where'd you go to high school? Hoover High. Uh-huh. So it was in Glendo. Right. Yeah. So LA native. Thanks for coming back yeah. up from yeah. Encinitas to talk to me. Been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, lots of points of interest and stuff we can explore. Um, I guess the first thing I want to know, as somebody who is at the vanguard, like the activist vanguard of everything sustainable, regenerative, eco-friendly, you know, somebody who really lives in this space, like what's top of mind for you right now? What what do you have? You what do, what do you like knee deep in at the moment? That's most interesting. Right on. Well, um, we uh, we're uh, launching with partners, um, including Patagonia, the the clothing company, uh-huh. and then um, leading animal welfare orgs like Compassion World Farming, leading fair labor orgs like Farewell Project, and leading soil health organizations like Rodale and Demeter. Yeah. And Demeter holds the biodynamic standard, and Rodale's the the heart of the organic farming movement. Um, a single standard called regenerative organic that mm-hmm. basically brings together the best of the soil health, animal welfare, and fair labor into a single standard, a, si- a single consumer facing mm-hmm. certification standard, so that when you purchase food or clothes or soap, you can know that not only was it grown in a way that respects the soil, but also all the people and the farmers and the workers involved were treated fairly. And any animals or livestock involved, where it was a pasture-based system, uh, no confined, like the high, like a like a whole other level of animal welfare criteria right. than the current organic standard. Right, like this high water mark that takes into consideration labor conditions, uh, the way the soil is treated, and uh, and on top of that, how the long the long term sustainability prospects of the manner in which the product, whether it be food or soap or what have you, is harvested. Yeah, totally. And in uh-huh. this, you know, we feel is like we like one third of the earth's surface has basically been terraformed under uh, industrial agricultural mismanagement. Mm-hmm. We we're we're wrecking the planet in a lot of different ways, but agriculture is one of our main ways of doing it. And but if we do it in a in a in a correct way with regenerative organic princ- principles if you look at a wild ecosystem, you have no no synthetic chemical inputs, no pesticides, right. no fertilizers. There's a sustainable balance of animal and plant life, um, and it's all integrated. And our farming systems need to replicate a natural ecosystem and not be dependent on synthetic chemical inputs. Which, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, soil health is is 
is really, you know, the essential ingredient in, <laughs> you know, the, the long-term viability of our species and, and many animal species. It's a subject that's come up uh, on this podcast many times, most recently with Dr. Zach Bush. Do you know, do you know Zach at all? Uh, maybe. If you guys don't, you definitely okay, should cool. know each other because mm-hmm. sure. you're on the same wavelength here. Um, but I think it would be informative for people that, that perhaps, you know, aren't as steeped in this <clears throat> as you are, to understand the difference between organic and regenerative. And on top of that, kind of what's like canvas, what's going on in this world of labeling that I think is creating as much confusion as yeah. it is clarity. Right on. Well, um, I, I mean, so what's the the default right now, conventional industrial agriculture, is it's, it's basically chemical agriculture, gen, um, mostly genetically engineered commodity crops like soy and corn mm-hmm. that are grown for our, for feed. Like uh, one over one half of, of American agriculture now is devoted to feed crops um, that are inefficiently converted into animal uh, animal uh, energy, carbohydrates, and, and protein. Um, and these animals are in conf- confined animal mm-hmm. food factory CAFOs CAFOs and um so it's just you know it's 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 a horrendous uh situation from an animal welfare perspective and then but from an environmental perspective taking the the animals off the land and putting them in boxes um and then growing the feed crops where they were so that their fertility is not integrated into the cropping cycle they're Mm -hmm. instead you have these huge manure lagoons that are spewing methane into the air um we're we're instead bringing these crops to harvest with, with more and more synthetic nitrogen and other fertilizers and synthetic nitrogen is made in the Haber Bosch process. It's one of the most energy intensive reactions that we do on the planet. It consumes one to 3% of the world's energy uh, to make synthetic nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And then it destroys the soil biota, the natural life in soil. Soil is a living organism. It's a living ecosystem. And um, we're basically systematically destroying the life in that soil um, and bringing our crops to harvest with more and more chemical inputs and treating soil like dead dirt, like an inert medium, right. instead of the life-giving resource that it is. And um, so, um, so you know, and, and we have just way too much livestock, like the, the populations are yeah. like totally unsustainable. Um, so... So organic is like the is you know is is a is a good step a key step which is basically removes chemical inputs you can't use chemical fertilizers or, or chemical pesticides when you grow crops but in and of itself it doesn't have um, necessarily prescribe a, a, a high level way of managing your your farm it just says what you can't do it doesn't right. say what you should do mm-hmm. um, and regenerative is kind of what you should be doing and regenerative is a set of principles where you farm in nature's image and um, you, if you in a natural ecosystem you never see bare ground or that's a you know that's maybe there was a fire or something and then quickly it's covered over yeah and when you see our farmlands it's like bare and open to erosion and topsoil loss i mean that's that's ridiculous and we need to have roots in the ground all the time so you're always having you're always putting in your next crop or a cover crop as soon as you harvest uh, so you keep roots in the ground you keep a diverse crop rotation right um which this interrupts pest cycles naturally um and then uh, yeah, minimize the the chemical inputs, and it's essentially yeah. the Joel Salatin polyface farms model. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, it's in 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 large extent. I mean, I would my one critique of polyface. Um, I mean, obviously, it's outside of the factory farm model, uh-huh. and um, that's crucial. And obviously, having animals be on grass, especially ruminants, is 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 awesome. Um, but um, the feed, like he's like, so there's a difference between ruminants, which is your your cattle, right? And they they have large a, herbivores, large herbivores, so they can actually get their energy from grass. Um, but chickens and pigs, monogastrics like ourselves, they can supplement off pasture. I mean, they eat some bugs and some seeds, but they're the lion's share of their diet still coming from grain mm-hmm. that's being bought in from elsewhere. And so Joel is as of as my current understanding is still not like that grain like how that grain is grown is going to kind of make or break the um kind of the 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 impact of how the earth is being treated the amount of carbon that's being sequestered sequestered 
uh, one way to look at it is if we wave a magic wand and get all of our chickens and pigs out of their cages and back on the land in a kind of polyface style uh, uh, farm, which is obviously great from an animal welfare perspective to the extent that um, they're treated well and have freedom of movement and, and ideally their end is humane and quick, um, that even if we wave a magic wand, if we don't change their feed, like you're still for a monogastric, yeah. you still got to feed the same amount of corn and soy as you would in a cage right as on a on a, on a pasture yeah and you're gonna have to grow that somewhere and you have to grow it. and so how that's grown is mm -hmm. still matters right crucially and it's kind yeah. of a, a a hole in the alan savory argument right as well because isn't that sort of part of the same thing yeah so like one of our critiques of the savory certification is on, on the ruminant side it's solid that you know insofar as they're emphasizing cattle should be on grass they should be eating only grass uh, on on a given land mm -hmm. um, but their certification has a hole in insofar as bought in feed when you look at bought in uh you know corn or soy for your monogastrics but then even for ruminants they'll buy in hay chopped hay mm -hmm. and cut hay and a lot of times that hay is grown like all feed crops with a whole bunch of synthetic fertility and <coughs> pesticides so like even if you're regenerating the land where your livestock are roaming like what about the land that's growing all your feed crops and if you're not taking responsibility for uh -huh. that then you're not having you, you don't have you don't a comprehensive have a vision holistic. for exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, look you're a long time vegan dude like what mm -hmm. since like 96 or something like yeah, that like, yeah all yeah. right you know i've been vegan for 15 years uh mm -hmm. you know i would i would prefer to you know have a vegan utopia where we all wake up and realize that we don't need to be eating these animals at all that it's incredibly inefficient and unsustainable yeah, and cruel and all of that yeah. and just you know we all we all you know have this you know spiritual epiphany and we transcend to the next you know plane of consciousness overnight we're working uh, on it yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. i would you yeah, know, I'm I'm working hard towards that vision as well, but that's not mm -hmm. happening tomorrow. Uh, and given the fact that uh, it's not a plausible reality in the immediate future, we do have to consider, um, you know, better solutions for the omnivorous planet that we live on, and that involves taking into consideration, you know, how we're raising these ruminants. Is there a better way for the meat eating population while we continue to eat meat, and the demand for meat continues to rise so um one of the big questions i have for you is you know given you know i laud you for um pursuing this regenerative organic certification i think it's super important um but is this if we were to all adhere to this standard we couldn't we don't have enough land or resources to feed the demand for meat as it currently oh, stands yeah. right like if all farms certain you know adhere to this standard overnight all of a sudden we there'd be a lot less life we can't we can't do it right no, no i mean that's it i mean the, this method of farming depends on a on a, on a much lower population right 10 like of the population of livestock out of their cages integrated back into the land mm -hmm. and and you know and to be clear animals are not essential to a regenerative organic system you know we can't have a totally vegan uh, uh, method of farming, but insofar as livestock are involved, then yeah, they need to be integrated in a pasture-based way, and their population needs to be dramatically reduced. So, re regardless of whether we choose to eat meat or not, we have to eat much uh -huh. less of it and much better if we want to transition our agriculture to a truly regenerative yeah. basis. And and that becomes problematic when we see the rise of the middle class in places like China and India, where the yeah. demand for meat no, is skyrocketing right, right. now. Yeah, so that paints a, a grimmer picture well, in terms and, of the plausibility of this. Oh, absolutely. And actually, so another big piece of our advocacy is on meat reduction and uh -huh. ve vegan advocacy, and we we're big supporters of Good Food Institute. Yeah, and, um, you and know many Bruce other on that show. A couple yeah, times. Bruce, he's rocking, and obviously bringing in the next level meat substitutes and dairy substitutes mm -hmm. um, are key. Um, we just obviously need to be reducing our meat consumption in, in the developed world, but then, as you say, in the developing world, like this is not we, you know we we need to skip what we did. Uh -huh. like, like we need to. It's kind of like hopefully what they're doing with like going from no phones to you know 4G cellular. Like if we can skipping just skipping the step, skipping the you know skipping some coal, maybe going straight to solar. You know, right. if we can skip what we did here with 
going these right intensive to factory sell farming agriculture. Of, <laughs> yeah, you know, or, or at least, well, you know, because like India, right? Like they have, I mean, most of our population was and maybe still is vegetarian, although now that's starting to shift, but they still have the cultural memory uh-huh. of the ethics of it. So if you can bring in like, okay, so now maybe they develop a taste for, you know, lamb or, or whatever it is that is interfering with kind of their traditional mores. Like if you can bring in like a, you know, like a clean meat or a, something that mm. approximates that taste and texture and feel and price and everything else Bruce says, you know, then, you know, maybe we can avoid um, right. the disasters. And you, and you don't of, have to overcome a lifetime of, a lifetime habit of eating meat in a different way. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, the cultural memory is there and, you know, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be interesting because it's happening at some point. Yeah. It's, you know, um, I, I was on a panel with the found, with the CEO of Memphis Meats. Uh-huh. And I think- Uma the, Yeah. It was like a few years ago. And I think he had like, the meatballs were like 10 grand a pop yeah. at that point, but I think they're down to a grand and are about to be- 10 bucks and you know oh, and very wow. soon they're going to be you know 10 cents so yeah that'll be a whole different he world. keeps saying because I, I keep bugging him to come on the podcast he's like i'm not ready yet we're still working we still got a long way to go but it seems like it's advancing pretty quickly i mean it really is just a matter of time before they hit some inflection point and the price will will you know be able to comport with um consumer demand for it and we're going to see some big changes yeah i think i think uh, you know Increasing the availability of tasty plant-based options is, you know, a key part of the equation. And then the consciousness of, you know, why we should be thinking about, uh-huh. you know, what we're eating and do we really need to be killing an animal to sustain ourselves or do we, can we not do that? And if we choose to do that, let's like really take responsibility right. for that and make sure that animal lived a life that, you know, wasn't, you know, going to hell and back. Um, and you know, and that's a big other part of our advocacy is integration of cannabis and psychedelic allies mm-hmm. to help us wake up mm-hmm. to uh, some of these dimensions of our kind of collective planetary being. And um, so we're hopeful that, you know, we're going to be bringing these these allies into the culture in a significant way in, in the coming years. And as uh, as the sustainable, you know, plant based options are more and more uh-huh. available and, you know, yeah. And the consciousness, the vegan movement, everything else is really hitting its stride. So you yeah. are your grandfather's grandson. Yeah. You are. I mean, I want to get into the, I want to get into the consciousness stuff because this this is like amazing to me and super trippy and awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you're carrying a certain vibration that really is the legacy of your grandfather. And it's it's fascinating to see how you've taken that mantle in a very natural way. And not only you know gracefully ushered it into um, the business that you're running with your brother, but but also you know in this very activist way, in this very conscious capitalist way that has made not only a social impact but also um, an environmental and economic impact. Because you've grown this company from you know what what was it like four million yeah. in revenue in '98 to like 111 last year or something like that, right? 122. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. man. I mean, that is quite something. But let's track it back to your grandfather because this guy was like off the charts, like a rock star in terms of like what he was putting out into the universe at that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're um, just incredibly fortunate that our founder, my granddad, Dr. Bronner, um, mm-hmm. he was an amazing individual. He he himself was a third-generation master soap maker you know, from a Jew- German-Jewish Mm-hmm. So making family, um, he was, so by the time he came of age in the twenties, like his dad and two uncles were running the family enterprise. We had three factories and we were supplying most of the liquid soap to public washrooms in, in Germany. Um, he was clashing with his dad and uncles in more of a generational way. Um, they were pretty like, you know, they didn't want to be mixing politics and soap. And my granddad was pretty intense. Uh, mm-hmm. back then he was Zionist and, and just, just what do you think? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you a couple of times. Uh, what, what, what was it about? Like what made him that way? What you happened know, in I his childhood a, that made him this like spiritual warrior from a young age? Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, my, 
second cousin, like my my granddad's cousin said to me once, this guy Henry Epstein, he said, like, you know what? There was always one in a generation that was kind of out there, uh-huh. like in the Heilbronners. Like the, and, you know, my granddad got that gene. That's how he just kind of said yeah. it. I definitely got the gene um, yeah, in my you generation. Yeah, definitely have it. And yeah, you know, he was just kind of born different. I know he, he, you know, he got, he was, I remember my great aunt saying, yeah, that poor emo, you know, his dad beat him a lot, tried to beat that craziness out of him, Uh you know, and, and, (laughs) and so he came to the States when he was 21 Uh more to just kind of do his own thing and get, you know, kind of leave his family and, and forge his own life. But it was early days of the Nazi party, right? And he sort of saw it coming and was like, I'm out of here. No, he, I mean, it was the, I mean, this is 29. So, I mean, the eventual, eventual dimensions were not clear about mm-hmm. what was about to happen. Um, and he did become increasingly desperate to get his family out. Um, his, he, uh, his two younger sisters got out, one in 36. Um, Lottie went at the age of 20 and she ended up in a kibbutz in Israel, mm-hmm. the Engev. And then another, Louisa got out in 38, right before they closed the border. And she became a professor of German at UMass Boston. Mm. Um, but before that, developed waterproofing compounds for the American GI paratroopers in the Korean War, but didn't get any credit. Everyone's a chemist yeah. in your family. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, and so, but his parents, like many of the bourgeois Jews, thought they were going to write out the madness. and. Uh-huh. and uh, they're like, don't rock the boat. Yeah, like, we'll just, yeah. Know. Hitler will be. Everyone will forget mm-hmm. about him, you know. And uh, but the factory was Aryanized in 1940, and they were deported and killed in 42 and 44. Mm-hmm. Um, so out of that, this and, and then at the same time, my granddad had married and and fathered three children in the 30s, and then his wife died, got sick, and died right around the same time frame, in the mid 40s. So he was just dealing with immense tragedy. Uh, yeah. in his life but the way he dealt with it was you know, he felt urgently called that in a nuclear armed world that the next holocaust if we don't realize our transcendent unity across religious and ethnic divides that the next holocaust we're gonna all die we're gonna yeah. all perish and that's when he felt called to go forth and um, spread his his message of unity um, what he called the moral abc and he was also selling this, this natural. So, I mean, he had become a, so, a consultant to the U.S. soap industry mm-hmm. and helped P&Gs of the world build factories and launch products. Um, but, but his he, main thing was sort of giving these sermons, right? Did yeah. he, was he, did he come right to L.A. from he, Germany? Uh, no, he landed in, Chicago, in Milwaukee. Uh-huh. So he was in Milwaukee and then Chicago, which is kind of a crazy place to be. That was the center of anti-Semitism in the States back then. That's Father McLaughlin had this radio show. That was super anti-Semitic. He uh-huh. was Chicago based and not the best place in certain respects. But um he he was actually in nineteen forty seven, he was actually interned in a mental asylum against his will. Some uh, a guy named Fred Walker had actually crucified himself or someone obviously helped him for Dr. Bronner's peace plan. So he gotten on the authorities' radar screens and so they basically locked him up. Um Right, and, you got put in an asylum for a minute there. Yeah, and uh, during which we have he de- designed like a settling system for this factory across the river that was spewing waste. He actually like cleaned it up for them, like while he was in there. Like he was <laughs> while, did a job. He was institutionalized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and oh then and then he fled on his third attempt. He he got out of there, and then he came straight to. He escaped. Yeah, he escaped and came to L.A. Oh my so god! So that's uh, and then and then set up shop in Pershing Square. Mm-hmm. Where he's in a tenement hotel, you know, mixing up his family soaps and sermonizing on the moral ABC, and um, it's real, all all one all one philosophy. God faith. Yeah, they, which is kind of like uh, does it derive from the teachings of the Essenes? Yeah, so he yeah. saw himself as an Essene rabbi, right? And. Um, and but but he basically drew from all faith traditions. He, his attitude is that all all spiritual giants of whether it's Gautama or Moses or Lao Tzu or Socrates that it, that they all were astronomer prophets. They're all inspired, witnessing the majesty of the yeah. heavens, the cosmic rhythms, and um, and that all of them were basically saying the same thing: that you know, get over yourselves, realize, realize your transcendent unity. We're all children mm-hmm. of the same divine source, and. That's so for him, the labels were a way of showing the commonality across the different faith traditions and that, um, you know, that 
that fundamentalism was the enemy, not not right. religion per se. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever been to Rancho La Puerta? Yeah, in Mexico. Yeah, totally. So, do you know Edmund. the story of Edmund Zekely? Zekely, how do yeah. you say it? Yeah, I think because he sounds it. like a very similar guy to your grandfather. Yeah, totally, I mean, man. Amazing dude who was like fruitarian in the jungles and had met Deborah's family when she he, she was like a child bride, and he creates this uh, this center. It's a whole long story of him being Jewish and not being able to settle in. Right. America or being able to go back to Europe and finding this piece of land in Mexico and becoming like the first pioneer of wellness and, and fitness in the same era in which your grandfather was living. But he was an area almost. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And being totally into the Essenes, he wrote all these super trippy books and, you know, it was all about healthy lifestyle and yeah. living this ascetic life based on the tradition of those Palestinian Jews. I almost went and bought, uh, built myself a biogenic dwelling and was doing the grass yeah. for a little bit. I mean, he, <laughs> yeah, he, he's. Uh, he, he, Did they know each other? Um, they must have. They must right? have. They must he, have. Because, yeah. because like Aldous Huxley and people like that were going down to Rancho La Puerta. Yeah. At the time and Edmund must have. He he was probably I, around your grandfather's age. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, my granddad, you know, had his the scene book of life. I mean, I was right. definitely totally marked up, and um, so I'm I'm sure there was some direct communication, and obviously on the same wavelength and. You know, they were bringing in, you know, meditation and Pilates and raw foods. And, uh-huh. Like yeah, way before yeah, anybody, yeah, you know, totally. that was the first place also where, because he was, Edmund was Hungarian and a lot of um, below the line uh, workers in Hollywood, you know, people lighting camera, people like that um, were Hungarian as well. And it was a small community. Um, they all knew each other. So you know, that part of Hollywood kind of knew what Edmund was doing down in Mexico. And so when a starlet needed to like lose weight or dry out or, you know, some actor Mm. or whatever, they would, they would, they would send them down to Rancho La Puerta. And that was the first, that was the beginning of like, you know, what we all know, like when Hollywood people like go to detox or or whatever, but they were doing it back in like the forties and fifties before any of, you know, this stuff that we kind of you know, see everywhere happening now. Yeah, no, right on, man. And, and I guess, Ed, I mean, I actually just got the full download there in the last year and a half. Uh, I finally went and visited uh-huh. and, and I guess he, you know, he was pretty radical, you know, totally he didn't like, radical. you know, he didn't quite like how the spa kind of was gentrifying or whatever. Uh-huh. I mean, he was like pretty, you know, it's pretty ascetic and wanted, you know, people to be on this pretty strict raw food, yeah. you know, yogic path. And, uh, yeah, I guess clashed a little bit, but um, but Deborah's really made something wonderful happen there. And, she's amazing. I mean, yeah. she's got to be like ninety five now or something. Yeah, like and, that. She's and she's still still kicking it. it yeah. You know. Um, anyway, we got off we got off track a little bit, but um, there's so many similarities there. I couldn't help yeah. but like talk about that. But the thing is, um, I mean, so your grandfather. <laughs> He's he's giving these sermons in Pershing Square, which for people who don't know is like the square right in the center of like downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. Preacher man. But then yeah. people are more interested in the soap than what's coming out of his mouth, right? So the soap becomes a vehicle for him to deliver his message. Right. He, he realizes that many people are um, just coming to his sermons to get the soap he's, he's selling on the side and not sticking around to hear what he has to say or, or paying attention so he puts what he what he's saying on the labels of our soap, and the soap always has been more of um, the vehicle for the label than the labels yeah. there to promote the the soap. I remember and, the first time that I actually took a mo- like I saw the soap in the store, and I took a moment to actually read what was on it, and I was like, "This is." fucking insane like how yeah. do they even get away with having this like on a consumer product in a store like have you ever actually sat and read what's on yeah. this it's completely mind-blowing yeah and it's almost like it just slips under the radar like i don't know how many people like don't even pay attention to that but like it's super intense yeah it's you know it's right there <laughs> I mean, in plain like, sight I know. You know? it's yeah. right on the soap yeah uh you know i, I think like you know, my granddad uh, went. To, he blames on the shock treatments he received when he was when he was interned against his will. But he went. He went. He basically lost his vision and was completely blind by by 1970. 
And I don't think he realized just how busy the labels were getting uh-huh. as he was downloading more and more of the full truth on, on the. He's just he, channeling this, yeah. right? And so now, you know, so now we've got you know three thousand words on on a on a core label, and um and it's intense as you say, but it's also like very in- interesting textural kind of backdrop. And when you look at it, it's got this old apothecary feel and look. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, ideally people spend time and and, and grok the message. But it's kind of just kind of conveys, you know, kind of old time authenticity right. and simplicity, and yeah, yeah. it has so, that kind of vintage vibe that yeah. now is is like hipster modern, I suppose. Yeah, I know? mean, it violates every design principle, you right. know, but it <laughs> yeah. works. You know. <laughs> has yeah. it always had that same look and feel? Has it evolved at all, or have you stayed true to what it looked like when he was doing it? Yeah, well, he evolved it himself. Like, there's a funny quote in Esquire that interviewed him in like 1973, and the and the reporters like, you know, hey, what happened to Freud and Young? You know, uh-huh. and my grandma was like, you know, Freud and Young important, but no longer relevant to uniting the great space of birth. And, you know, <laughs> so he was, yeah. So break down his his uh, philo- you know, his like psychonaut philosophy of you know unity of consciousness for the betterment of humanity. Yeah, I you know I mean he it was within an overall you know Judaic I, I think um, context, uh-huh. but um, you know he saw that the creator and creation were one, we're all one, we're at in our essence one with each, one another, and our separateness is illusory, and um, and yeah, so and he just advocated uh, a simple living close to the earth. Um, he conducted most of his business on the sun deck on a, in a leopard print speedo uh-huh. and, uh, you know, and <laughs> oh my God, yeah. it's yeah. like a movie. Yeah. No, he was amazing. You, you know? know, just really liberated cat. Um, and, but really intense, you know? I mean, right. Yeah. If you, yeah, he was kind of on the, coming from the mountaintop. And at the time, I mean, we can look back on it now and laud him and see him as this visionary, but what, how was he received you know, in, you know, when he was around. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the rise of the counterculture really resonated. Uh-huh. It was like perfect timing. Um, I mean, here's this guy, you know, talking about, you know, peace and love and living in harmony with the earth with a soap that's concentrated, versatile. You can wash your, your hair, your dog, the dishes by yeah. the side of the river. It's like not, the famous 18 uses or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and just really resonated to the time. It. Yeah. Which we, we now have toothpaste uh-huh. and we say brushing with Bronner has just got a lot better. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I actually haven't tried to brush my teeth with like the Castile soap. Yeah. It, you know, it works. Uh-huh. You know, it's not, I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh huh. So uh, yeah. So with that, the, like beat culture and then, 60s counterculture he 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 had his little niche within that yeah and and i think he was frustrated that his audience wasn't you know Mm -hmm. planetary wide and and he he wanted to unite the spaceship instantly and you know it was um i guess maybe disappointed it wasn't happening on the timetable or uh, that he was hoping but you know i i think we're you know appreciating all of his um you know incredible gifts but also some yeah. of the flaws in his character and you know my dad my granddad was not a good dad I and mean, my granddad basically went to go save the world and abandon his family more or mm-hmm. less and and w- was so my dad and that's uncle, what happens with guys like this yeah you know? that's the other side of the whole thing yeah you know and he had dubbins of the holocaust behind him and you know uh-huh. just like you know it's just i mean there's just a lot of generational tragedy coming through the generations but my dad really compensated and made sure that our family, like the families was first and, and wanted nothing to do with all one vision or religion in general. Mm -hmm. He was just all about family and community. And so me and my brother and sister, you know, came up in this incredible household in Glendale, Reaganite suburban, right. Stable, stable and just beautiful. And my dad was like the most moral guy. I mean, he would just, you know, stand up for whoever and just volunteer his time and, and so we blend his um, kind of focus on pragmatic. What can you do for your brother right here, right now? You uh-huh. know, with my granddad's more cosmic, yeah, trip. utopian idealism. Because yeah. he set the company up originally as like a nonprofit religious organization, and would just funnel all the profits back into you know into causes, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like not. 
I mean, that there's conscious capitalism and then there's just, you know, an unsound business practice in terms of like longevity, right? Yeah. And, and the IRS disagreed with his tax exemption. This is not uh, a religious organization. Yeah. This is a soap company. Right. Yeah. So, so, and actually uh-huh. my dad stepped in, one of my mom and uncle in the late eighties to, um, basically get our, the company out of bankruptcy. My granddad was owed crap tons of back taxes on, a uh-huh. on, you know, basically not having paid them. And, um, but you know, I was surrounded by a bunch of bad advisors as well. And so my dad and mom and uncle, um, dad, especially really, you know, righted the ship and yeah. my dad had come up and was working for a chemical specialty firm as the head of operations in Atwater area. Um, where I came up and developed, among other th- other things, firefighting foam um, for forest and right. structure fires. That's now standard and modified a version for Hollywood as a fake snow. So we grew up blasting snow foam on trees, right? For alcohol And this is still the same mm-hmm. stuff that they use, right? Did he patent that and like it's his? That's the industry yeah, standard. It's, yeah, Warner Brothers is a master distributor, but uh-huh. yeah. So wow. he, you know, so so the firefighting foam is owned by some Tel Aviv based chemical conglomerate right. at this point. So when you're growing yeah. up in essentially the Pasadena area, Glendale, like yeah. that must have been, you must have been a popular kid. Like let's go over to your house and, and we blast and foam on each other. On, yeah, all man. Over the place. Yeah, it was incredible. Uh-huh. And yeah, I mean, when you, when you blast foam in the world, I mean, it just transforms, you know, every, uh, we're all one under foam, uh-huh. you know, and, and it just trying to, you can't be in a bad mood. Yeah. You know, it just transfigures the world. I mean, whatever's going on is over, you know, it's now it's foam time and, and, uh, and it's just this ecstatic liberatory space. Um, and now Bronner's, um, you guys have like a truck that drives around and sprays foam at yeah, people's private parties yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So kind of blending my granddad and dad. So we take uh, Dr. Bronner's soap, which is at this point made, you know, it's the same simple recipe mm-hmm. as for five generations. Um, but, you know, now with regenerative organic, we are, our olive oil is coming from Palestine and Israel. Um, all of our coconut oil is coming from Sri Lanka out of a tsunami relief project and palm oil in this super sustainable way, uh, out of Ghana in his smallholder projects. Um, but we run that through the compressed air foam system, uh, and, and, and blast basically Dr. Bronner's soap, soap in like a, in a firefighting foam form. Uh And we have a fire truck that in honor of my dad, my dad's power animal is an Eagle. So we have this huge blazing, like fire Phoenix on the front with Tibetan fire on the fire truck <laughs> and then like big plexiglass yeah. trailers that we like shower trailers we blast uh-huh. foam into for pride. And do you take that you know. to Burning Man? Yeah, actually the, the original foam unit was, I built it. So when my dad, my granddad died in 97, then my dad died in 98 and I had a whole complex journey to, uh, embrace, um, we're going to, we're going to yeah. get there. We're going to yeah. get into that, but okay. go ahead. But yeah, so we had to shut down my dad's side of the foam business, basically, uh-huh. and focus on the soap business. It was just this overwhelming time. And like 10 years later, I remember I was just like, you know, pop, you know, how'd you do it? How'd you, you know, raise a family and run a business? Mm-hmm. And, you know, just going through a tough time and just remembering like, wow, how much fun we had with the foam. And right. so I went and built a, a foam unit from one of his late designs and brought it to Burning Man uh-huh. in 2009. And just, you know, hey, this will be fun. And like, it's sure enough, man, we were clearing yeah. out blocks of people are like, <laughs> what? You know, and like, just like, we're just blasting them. And, you know, so that's, it was basically yeah. born at Burning Man or reborn at uh-huh. Burning Man. Yeah. But the foam kind of, yeah. in many ways, is what saves the soap company. It was mm-hmm. like the what sustained your family and allowed you guys, allowed your dad like some, some, um, stable income in order to write the ship with the soap company. Is that fair? Oh yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, saved in more ways than one really. I mean, it was my dad's independent role for my granddad. who was just kind of super intense and overbearing. And so my, you know, it was a way for my dad to just kind of, he oversaw right. the soap production for my granddad his whole life, uh-huh. but just had his own business and, and yeah. focus in life. And, um, and then, yeah. And then as far as income, right. I mean, our, so company was in bankruptcy. So absolutely yeah. the phone business was. So when you were a kid, what was your perspective on your grandfather? Uh, it, you know, he was intense and especially I think for his grandkids, he just thought it was extra important for us to download the, the moral ABC. And so uh-huh. it was just kind of nonstop. But know? was your dad like pissed off? 
my dad would he was protective of us you know i think because my grand i mean it was fine it was just you know my grand was like you know we must unite to spaceship earth you know and like you know You're what's like, the 13th unite to spaceship earth you weren't even here for your event you were you couldn't even stick around for to raise me yeah right yeah for it was a little triggering for my dad uh-huh. um for me it was just kind of like what you know it's kind of sailing over my head um but uh you know he would he would say you know we expected us to memorize the the moral abc but luckily he was blind so we could pick up uh a bottle and you know he's like what's the 13th and i'm like uh he was like oh very good very good <laughs> you know uh, but uh yeah it wasn't until later that i really appreciated uh-huh. what my granite was all about so and, i gather that you were a fairly traditional kid growing up i mean playing football and soccer yeah and, you know you weren't like the hippie grateful dead kid no uh-huh. um i mean we you know we're mischievous but yeah we're not uh yeah it took a little while to you know really understand that dimension right. of society and business and right so you're traditional you go to harvard you study biology you're playing sports you're all american kid in many ways uh but then life brings you to amsterdam and then things begin to shift is that is yeah that accurate yeah uh, you know college was where the shift began uh-huh. um you know definitely um you you know like being exposed to cannabis and psychedelics initially in, in, within college context and a lot of free thinking and, and different ideas and um you know biology i i was um you know i was never like the most academically inclined kid and, and these non-interactive large lecture formats were like you know what, what what am i doing here this is wasting my time i'll just copy the notes before the final you know uh-huh. like this is an interactive learning and um and just spent a lot of time just with friends and and especially cannabis was a big sacrament and kind of retired from alcohol culture and and in some ways my at least my athletic identity wrapped up within NCAA football and played rugby which was a more club sport a little way looser kind of yeah. the black sheep of the athletic program but a lot of fun uh-huh. um but in some of those um early experiences well and then with mushrooms and psychedelics an early an early mushroom experience was um was i just remember looking down at my arm like you know what does it mean at a quantum level i'm not different like my body's not different from the world and when i eat and i poop the world's pouring into me and through me and i'm just one with it and had the like my first kind of unity experience you know not you know in a super overwhelming way, but just like, whoa, and just yeah. really re- starting to realize like the limitations of the materialistic kind of mm-hmm. scientific worldview that would explain like human consciousness and being just as a kind of a narrow adaptive trait that, you know, in, in a certain sense, sure, but was completely inadequate to the mm, level of the mystery of our existence. And, um, so I was, you know, re- rejecting, and I had re- earlier rejected Christianity. I was raised Protestant, actually. My um, dad wanted nothing to do with anything. My mom was Protestant. Mm. And then, but when I was 12, I was like, well, if God loved the world so much, why did he send his one and only son to, to just here? What about the Chinese? And, you know, and just had rejected Christianity kind of on its own terms. But then was really having a problem with this materialistic kind of science worldview and um, so graduated Harvard with, you know, the fair amount of question. I mean, I was still pretty apolitical, um, but had started to have some important questions and, yeah. and experiences, but then yeah, Amsterdam is where the fuel right. kind of got. So what, I mean, what led you to Amsterdam just to, just to deepen that inkling that was initiated at Harvard? Yeah. And, and I mean, at the time, I mean, it's, Canna- I mean, I saw s- within the cannabis experience, like something really important, like that there was, you know, that we were, this was a sacrament worth appreciating. Like, I mean, I knew I, I had th- not maybe the healthiest relationship at that point, but enough to know that what we're doing right here is way more important than what a lot of people are doing around us right now. And like just being with each other and listening to music and laughing and being awesome and uh-huh. um and so of course amsterdam at the time was the mecca um of cannabis culture right and um this is before prop 215 this is 95 um so mo- a lot of the american growers and were over in amsterdam and so i happened to be intersect well i had a euro pass i mean technically i was going to go see europe 
but we got to Amsterdam and it was the eighth annual High Times Cup, Cannabis Cup. <laughs> and uh, that was no more, no more train rides. You're just there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I went into <laughs> yeah. the squat, you know, there's yeah. an incredible squat scene there, this uh-huh. activist artistic squat scene, the whole, you know, all, all so international and interesting. And I'm just like, what? This is amazing. I don't, I'll go somewhere else later. I'm going to stay here. And um, just ended up having some huge experiences, some really massive psychedelic experiences. And, was in a squat with you know multi generational like people coming out of the counterculture and in particular there was a church in Arkansas of all places that had formed with cannabis as its sacrament in ninety three our church it was called and sure enough the feds busted it up and church members were on the run facing ten years to life and a couple of them were in my squat and that was in the context of me of these really massive psychedelic experiences that really exposed me to the to the fact that somehow love and light is at the heart of this existence as absurd and tragic and hard as it can be that that is our ground of being and um and you know meeting these people like just really waking up to america and that wow these beautiful people if they step back back foot here are going to be arrested and they're thrown away Mm-hmm. And the sacrament that helps us wake up. The the drug war is in a, an important respect, the religious war on the sacrament of my people. And so really waking up to that, to that dimension. And Sam actually also was vegetarian. So that was my first, like, I remember him just, I was wide, wide open, you know, and people were coming at me and like, he's like, yeah, you know, why are you eating meat? You know, and I just remember like, just kind of going on a, on a cannabis meditation, like, just like, yeah, okay, I got a knife. I'm in the store. I, can you know kill that cow or i can just chop down some some lettuce and you know uh, i think i'll just let the cow alone and and that was it and that was it you know just like a real easy kind of uh you know i mean it was you know not super easy but it was like a you know like okay it's pretty clear that and that's kind of in a way like these allies can help us when we use them intentionally collapse distances um and barriers and um, so anyways, it was just reorganizing my life in a huge way, going through these huge shifts, mm-hmm. um, and waking up, to, you know, well, what else is wrong, you know, in the world and just waking up to the collective disaster of Western consumption on the planet. Um, you know, not just in terms of meat and animal products, but just in general, our rapacious rape of nature to fuel our material economy and just the total lack of consciousness and, yeah. I mean that's quite a spiritual epiphany. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I don't have I don't have direct experiences with with psychedelics. I'm I'm like I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've been in recovery for a long time and I never uh experimented with psychedelics and now I feel like that privilege has been taken away from me. Um so I I won't have that experience. Um but uh I can't deny that I know a number of people like yourself who have had very profound experiences with these substances. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been not just life changing, but like determinative of the trajectory that you then choose to pursue for the rest of your life. Like those experiences inform in many ways, because at that time it wasn't like you were going into the soap business right you don't want anything to do with that yeah in fact my relevant uh, realization over there was like i don't have to do anything as far as my family Uh or anything i I can grow plants and 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 live you know and just fight this cause and that's what i did i came back sold all my stuff and announced to my parents that i'm going to get to amsterdam to grow plants i mean everyone needs to stand up against this unjust you know religious (laughs) war and i'm vegan which they were like way more upset about than the Oh really? Going, yeah, that was the yeah, thing they yeah. couldn't like, handle what? that. Oh what wow, is, this is crazy. But, but it's amazing you like <laughs> tapped you tapped a vein that you know your grandfather was dialed into, right? Mm-hmm. It's almost like you opened yourself up to a, a, a level of consciousness that was vibrating, you know, where he happened to be sitting, it, and you have this like all you know all one awareness, mm-hmm. this unity consciousness that kind of overcomes yeah. you, and you have this sense of connectedness that then like protracting out into everything that you've done since 
infuses everything. Like sustainability is about connectedness. It's about a holistic perspective of the impact that we're having on the soil and the downstream, you know, implications of all of these decisions that we make. It's not just organic or vegan or non-vegan. Like we have to broaden that aperture and realize the cascading implications of, of how all of these things are interrelated in a more, in a broader and more holistic way. And that sensibility, like the experience you related about, you know, pooping and the world kind of going through you is a, is like a micro example of the macro being the sustainability implications of how, you know, we raise food to feed humans on planet earth. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. And just like how that, yeah. And in taking responsibility for your, your, your plate as a farm is, is your section of the garden out in the world, you know, what does it look like? And when you're being unconscious about what you're eating, you know, you're just creating a disaster, uh -huh. you know, just animals being treated abysmally and being fed crops grown in a completely uh, unsustainable way. But when you like take by workers who are being unfairly treated, yeah, man, it's just oh, totally. And then, but the solutions right there too. I mean, if you just are conscious about it and like, okay, I want to know who's growing my food and is it being done right? And if I'm going to eat an animal product, is it from a pasture based system where the animal lived a life worth living, you know? And, um, you know, you can start to make a shift by taking responsibility mm -hmm. um, with your food choice. Yeah, and, and embodying your grandfather's ethos and sensibility of using commerce as a form of activism. Like soap to him was a means of delivering a message and you've mm -hmm. really done the same thing, but just done it in a more fiscally responsible way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all, I mean, it is, it is all cycles of energy and, and you know, just in, in our soaps, like, food on a plate you know it's all agricultural based and like us taking responsibility for our supply chains and um making sure all the farmers are, are being paid a fair price and are growing our coconuts and olives and totally righteous ways palm it's a real important yeah when one. you say palm oil like mm -hmm. alarm bells go off because right. it's the it's the number one offender when it comes to rapacious you know rainforest yeah. de, you know de-evolution yeah. So, um, you know, we also use hemp seed oil and, um, you know, hemp has this reputation as being like the wonder crop that'll save humanity and palm has the reputation as like, you know, the evil, most vile crop that'll take us, you know, right off the cliff edge. And the reality is, is that it's that the, the issue is how do we grow our crops, whether it's palm or hemp, it's the method of how we do it. It's not what the crop is. And palm is actually the highest per acre yielding oil crop and can be done in a totally regenerative, organic, sustainable way. Um, unfortunately, what's happening is in like a lot of our commodity crops are being, uh, they're clear cutting rainforests, mm -hmm. ripping up wetlands, dislocating communities, eliminating orangutan habitat in Borneo and in Indonesia, especially. But, you know, soy plantations are ripping up the, you know, Amazon. And so it's just a, in either case, like, you know, how do we grow these crops in a regenerative way? And so with palm oil, like we're like in like every company ever we're we were buying from brokers and we had no mm -hmm. visibility. We were buying on the commodity market. It's like who's got the cheapest coconut oil that meets our spec, you know, and that's how everyone you don't buys. even know where it comes from. You have no idea. Right. And so that's the problem. You just have this race to the bottom in the world. So we said, okay, we want to know who the farming communities are and just make sure that they're doing it correctly and, and then go to market in partnership with them. Um, so in, in the case of palm oil, we identified a really cool project in Ghana where um, smallholder farmers not farming more than two to five acres each um, are, are growing palm and are intercropping with banana and cassava in a kind of a rich farm ecosystem. And there's plenty of wild biodiverse habitat um, for wildlife. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, the palm is an especially important one, obviously, given mm -hmm. the concern um, with when it's not done that way, it's generally done in the worst possible. And they're way. able to meet your, your demand and do it in a predictable way that, yeah, that allows well, you to, you know, basically run your business fluidly. Yeah. So, um, uh, at this point, yes, but it's been a whole adventure getting there. Yeah. And we do have some kind of next best uh, suppliers that are um, doing a really good job. There's Agropalma is a really good entity um, in Brazil. 
and they're doing a really good job. It's not small holder, but they're doing a pretty good job as far as when it comes to palm. There's another uh, pro- project in Ecuador called Natural Habitats, and they're doing a pretty good job. Uh-huh. Um, but I mean, we do the best job, and so we're we're um, basically at at this point supplying all of our own demand. Right, and you're getting your olive oil from both Palestine and Israel. Yeah. yeah. So so ninety percent from the West Bank, from Palestinian farmers in the West Bank who are basically farming regeneratively by default, um, and have been facing really difficult circumstances bringing their olive oil to market even local markets for a while there just under the occupation mm-hmm. um and so we i did a google search for fair trade olive oil and the only thing that came up was canaan and the west bank and i was like wow okay that's intense yeah but uh but they're beautiful beautiful project founded by this guy <coughs> nasu abu farah who uh was a professor of anthropology at university of Ma- uh, wisconsin at madison had a coffee house folk kind of folks singing uh center for the arts kind of vibe and um took the fair trade idea that emerged out of coffee and cocoa and applied it to olives to its farmers back home and then so we partnered with him but then to be clear we're not being anti-israel about that we do uh 10 from the israeli side half from a jewish family farm that happens to be related to us like five generations back and then half from a Christian Arab Israeli project in the Nazareth region. So our olive oil is Muslim, Jewish, Christian in, right. in the which, in the Dr. which perfectly you know yeah. fuses with your grandfather's vision and the yeah. spiritual principles that underpin the whole enterprise. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, like it's amazing, just pretty beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So how do you? Well, two things. First of all, um, as you know, as somebody for whom sustainability is top of mind and a a huge priority. Um, I have to ask the question, like if you're importing all of these, you know, products from all over the world, there's a, you know, there's a carbon implication to that. Do you try to offset that or how do you think about or, you know, manage that aspect of the business? Yeah. um, So um, in the case of soap, we're limited to using what's called hyaluric oils and these are shorter chain saturated fats Uh um so all fats and oils are chemically triglycerides so whether it's beef fat or coconut oil it's all glycerin backbone with three fatty acids and how long those fatty acids are and how many double bonds are in them makes the different characteristics of different fats and oils um so in the case of soap um your your high lather good hard water soap comes from shorter saturated oils and that basically means coconut and palm kernel oil Mm -hmm. those are the main main sources so we're we we need to be involved in the tropics for those raw materials and then olive oil obviously we could be sourcing here from california um but you know i think you know in the hierarchy of value we're we're just super psyched by the fair trade um project going on in in palestine and israel and the holy land um so we're going to continue with that but we are uh um embarked right now on a scope three emission audit and like basically taking responsibility for all the emissions involved at every aspect of our business you know all the freight all the everything Uh and then instead of investing in offsets um we're we're pioneering this movement called insetting which um in within our own supply chains within our own agricultural supply chains Regenerative organic methods like composting and returning biomass to the soil, you actually can sequester carbon in the soil. And in fact, soil is the largest land-based carbon sink. Um, and if we were to adopt regenerative organic methods at global scale, we could mitigate and bring down something like a third of excess atmospheric carbon back into the soil. A, a, a lot of the carbon up in the atmosphere is from mismanaged soils from all the life that's been destroyed and killed um has been oxidized the atmosphere but when you bring that soil back to life and are you know enriching it with carbon rich uh compost and inputs you can start to build that carbon back up bring that life back and and that carbon so we're in a we're basically uh insetting our our carbon uh through Uh through these practices in in our own agricultural supply chains that's super cool and meanwhile like you guys are solar powered and yeah we're solar and yeah and that's it i mean we need to decarbonize our economy and go green um but you know we have this huge legacy load of excess atmosphere carbon dioxide and 
And that's where regenerative organic is like the soil. I mean, obviously there's all these high tech solutions yeah. of taking carbon out of air, but I mean, if we just farm correctly, we can put a lot of it back into the soil. Mm -hmm. So, well, there's a lot of lip service given to, you know, the idea of conscious capitalism, but this is bred into the very DNA of everything that you guys do. Um, and I'm wondering whether at some point along this journey, when you start to take things like fair trade and um, making sure that you're sourcing from these regen, you know, farms, I would imagine that's driving your price point up. There had to be people saying you're insane. Like you're going to go out of business if you try to adhere to this level of integrity. Uh, you're going to price yourself just right out of the market, and there's no way. Like if you're if you're interested in sustainability, we should make sure the business is sustainable first. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I mean that you know without generating profits and healthy margins, yeah. we're we're nowhere, uh -huh. and we can't support any of the other causes and. Um, you know, and we do cap our family salaries at five to one and, and all right. our profits. Well, how long have you been doing that? Since 20 years. Oh, no, 15 years. 15 years. So basically the highest paid person at the company can't make more than five times the, the amount, amount of salary the lowest paid. Yeah. And, you know, we could see early on kind of what was happening. And, and you know, I was like, I felt, well, within that five to one, we can mm -hmm. have a lot of fun, you know. And, um, and then just as like a good just a good cutoff that right at the time and in a world sense. of of ceo you know compensation packages that are completely insane and out of whack that's a refreshing breath of fresh air yeah and and that you know you can just do so much good with you know not that much money if, if you're really um focused on deploying it correctly and know the people you know like yeah. closely involved in the causes like we are i mean we really care about them they're not cause marketing for us like we we really want to that's shift the, the world that's you know? the and, differentiator i mm. you know i feel like there's so many companies out there now who know they have to play in this sandbox a little bit especially with the coming of age of millennials who are concerned about these sorts of you know save the world type issues they want to patronize companies that are doing good and giving back but most the vast majority of companies who are quote unquote giving back are doing it in a very perfunctory way. Like, oh, we'll give you 1% of, to this or whatever, but it's not really part of the identity or like I said earlier, like the, the fabric, the DNA of the company. There's, a, different, there's yeah. a difference. Like this is what you guys do. Like the company exists so that you can support these causes. I feel that, like. That's right. And, that's, and that was when I came in, and decided that I did want to run Bronner's and, you know, had gone through an evolution of like, wow, I finally understand what my granddad's all about. Uh -huh. really we didn't even them. get to the part of you coming back from Amsterdam and deciding you're going to be a soap dude. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> you, but you kind of got it with, yeah. you know, like, okay, I, I got to the plane of where my granddad was and totally, whoa, you're right on it. You're hundred percent correct. Uh -huh. We do live in a spiritual mystery. There is love and light at the heart of all these faith traditions. And if they don't take themselves literally, and make idols out of their beliefs and symbols and let them be open and fluid. Like, yeah, they're, they're all pointing at this kind of mystery and, and, um, and finally understood what my granddad was all about and took a little while to fully embrace, uh, coming back to work for my dad. Um, but I became a mental health counselor in the Boston area uh -huh. for a while and was, did paranoid schizophrenic counseling and, um, but in the course of this, did a lot of journaling and, and just realized if a company like Dr. Bronner's were to offer me a job, I go for it in a second. This is incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then, your, was your yeah. brother working for the company at the time? No, he, in a similar way, he graduated Brown and went to teach English in Japan. Um, and he didn't, so, so I let my dad know shortly after my, um, uh, Dr. Bronner died in March 7th of 97, on the same day our daughter Maya was born. So this is a very intense Wait, day. hold on a second. Yeah. Your daughter was born on the same day your grandfather died. Yeah, same, same exact day, March 7th of, of 97. Holy and, shit. And I was reading a book by this guy, Rudyard, uh, Rudyard I forget his last name, but he's- um, Kipling? No, uh, he was like an astrologer, kind of young astrologer cat. And he wrote this book, called the planetarization of consciousness 
And I just remember that uh, that was the book I was reading, you know, and on and that day, on that, that day, and and you know, which was my granddad's whole. Was what was whole, going on astrologically yeah, on that day? There's some know, kind man. of convergence of you know yeah. celestial bodies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? you know, and for me, you know, I I don't. Yeah, I don't put like literalness into like necessarily any given constellation context, but uh-huh. I think in general as a symbolic language of the soul and deeper currents that we live and breathe in, I like respect it. And um, yeah, but that was a big, huge day. And, and shortly thereafter, let my dad know I was ready to come into the company. And then shortly after that, he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer mm-hmm. and um, given six months to live. Wow. Um, but which he he lived for twelve months. He was he lived to see his daughter married to my brother in law Michael, who's now our chief of operations. My sister Lisa's rad. She's got a blog called Going Green Green with a Bronner Mom. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, and our dad, you know, just really downloaded the ropes and trained you up. Yeah, and we we're you know had to shut down his foam company to just concentrate on the soap. But was it, I then within the next couple of years convinced my brother, like, hey, Mike, you got to come back, dude. Mm-hmm. This is nuts. And I'm not like I was. He had the yeah. same blocks I did working for my dad as working for, with his brother. And, uh-huh. you know, I'd assure him, like, I'm right. way better. And, <laughs> 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 yeah. I've seen so, the light, man. Yeah. The all in one vision. It's happening. Y- yeah. <laughs> no, he's like, what? No. <laughs> no. He, yeah. So he and he's now we're now So he kind of f- handles the business end of it, right? And you're 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 like you, you can like be the cosmic engagement officer and you know. Yeah, you know, we um <laughs> like my brother would say, like we're uh-huh. 85, 90% the same, you know. Um the like we we share a lot of the similar passions and inclinations and um but yeah, he's he's a, a bit more pragmatic. I'm a little more cosmic, um, and uh, I definitely am geared at the activist side of the of the enterprise. And he's really, especially focused internationally. He's really built us out you know, internationally. But um, he's now president, and uh, we're fifty fifty in the company. Cool. Um, and yeah, just total partners. And, um, so what's uh, what's the future, man? What's uh, the future for Bronner's? What's the future for what's the yeah. what's the what what is the forecast for planet Earth from your perspective? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm optimistic that you know that the different strategies in place, you know, like if if we do, if we dramatically reduce the amount of meat we're eating, if we shift our agriculture and one third of the Earth's surface to a sustainable, regenerative, organic management, uh, if we decarbonize the economy. You know, integrate these psychedelic allies, and you know, and to your point, like that, there's there's ways to misuse these allies, and mm-hmm. they often are. But in a medicine practice, to look at okay, we've got a meditation practice, and then a medicine practice that Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, he saw LSD as an adjunct to meditative practice, and and um, and the founder of AA, Bill Wilson. Mm-hmm saw LSD famously as a, dabbled in LSD. Yeah, yeah. you know, as, as, as potential ways of interrupting habitual forms of thought and patterns of behavior. And um, um, so anyway, so so I'm optimistic with all these things. Um, well, I would just, we just can, to interject, yeah. um, I don't want to interrupt your fluidity of thought, but what's interesting about you is that you're somebody who's been ahead of the curve, much like your grandfather. I mean, your grandfather was way ahead of things, right? Yeah. You're like slightly ahead of things because mm-hmm. you, I mean, you're, are you the person who was behind the initiative at Bronner's to be the first company to really start working with hemp? Like as yeah. soon as it became, well, you kind of were doing it before it was quote, like technically legal, right? And there was lawsuits. Oh and yeah, you know, totally. Prevailing over, yeah, it was like, an now activist. it's all good. But mm-hmm. like to have hemp in your product, was kind of a radical thing yeah. not that long ago, yeah, right? So you were kind of initiated that whole thing. Um, and also you were talking about like microdosing and things like that, like before it became like a Silicon Valley, you know, hipster thing to do. Yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> you know, like, man. Yeah. Uh, trading the grandfather's legacy forward. Yeah, well, and that's yeah, right on, man. I mean, that's uh-huh. when I came into the company it was like, I'm we're gonna run this like my granddad did. This is uh-huh. an activist engine to make the world better, and that's what we're mostly here to do. And it's crazy yeah. what's going on with hemp now. Yeah, so 
you know, it was such a long, hard slog there for 20 years. And now the tide has finally turned. And, um, you know, back in the day, like when we first put into hemp seed oil in our soaps, yeah, it was a huge deal. Right. People um, thought they were going to test positive at work and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and you all the, you've been in a bunch of lawsuits over similar kinds of spats, right? With the USDA and. Yeah. So so first we went to the mat with DEA, like after Bush came in and 9-11, there was the DOJ went nuts. Department of Justice went nuts on medical marijuana, industrial hemp. And um, and Oregon's uh, euthanasia law, which is interesting because there's a much there's a ballot measure in Oregon to legalize medical therapeutic use of mushrooms, um, and definitely psilocybin, the active ingredient, has been found to be really beneficial for end of life anxiety. Like mm-hmm. that's one of the big breakthrough areas, like just helping people reconcile to the dying process as part of a larger life, you know, mystery and and. Um, and, uh, but anyways, like the DOJ was going nuts on all, all these different kind of progressive movements. And so we got in a big fight uh, to preserve right. industrial hemp seed oil uh, imports back in 2001, which we ultimately won in 2004. And then fast forward to today, um, Kentucky was really the big shift with tobacco going down to twos. And it's been the historical hemp heartland. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, has been our number one champion in Congress for the last four years. That's so weird. Yeah. And like John Boehner works for a cannabis company now. Yeah. Like, it's, we, like yeah. what kind of weird, bizarre universe do we live in? Yeah. Those things are happening. No, totally. And that's, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's incredible. So, um, so yeah, so I think um, it's just, so I was just in DC celebrating our big victory and it was, it's awesome, uh-huh. but we're, we're moving on. And like one of the, what the, the, the joke I would never, answer a journalist who would call me 20 years ago like oh isn't hemp a stocking horse for marijuana like right. you know aren't you just opening up cultural space to reform cannabis generally and of course the answer was always like no we're like we're focused on on industrial hemp for seed and fiber and you know, omega threes lacking in the american diet and you know hemp fibers it's amazing for textiles and clothing and and it's an amazing sustainable crop grows like a weed you don't need a lot of synthetic pesticides and fertility but uh, the joke was like, no, get it right. This is about LSD. <laughs> you know, so the, the end game, yeah. you know, that's but, what you're angling for. Yeah. You know, just, just integration of all these allies into the, into the culture and, um, to help us care about and give a shit in the first place about the problems and, and, and care enough to engage and solve them. Yeah. Well, so. I think we're at an inflection point with all of these issues. Uh, you know, the historical, uh, trajectory of hemp is so we could do a whole podcast on that alone with everything that William Randolph Hearst did to mm-hmm. prevent that from, you know, being a staple of American daily life um, because of his investments in paper and Henry Ford and his hemp car. Like there's a whole bunch of amazing stories that, that come out of that, but we're kind of past that now. We've overcome that hurdle. And then we have people like Michael Pollan writing books about psychedelic experiences we have johns hopkins and various other you know organizations pouring a lot of money into scientific research on the implications of whether it's microdosing or psilocybin or other psychoactive compounds on everything from depression to all manner of mental health ptsd etc so it's very interesting times and yeah. you know you've forecasted a lot of this we're now living in this we're kind of in this in-between phase, I think, but I think it's inevitable that we're heading in the direction that, that you foresee. When it comes to food and agriculture and soil, I too am optimistic, but, uh, and I've said this before, I feel like there is an arms race afoot. Like we have people like yourselves and there is a massive grassroots movement and a um, growing population of uh, activist consumers who are concerned about these things and the future of the planet for ourselves and future generations who are patronizing companies that are trying to do good like yours. Um, but that's butting up against, like we said earlier, you know, the growing populations uh, across the planet, not just in America, and this massive increasing demand for um, the products of animal yeah. agriculture and the rapacious, you know, um, practices that go into producing those. So who is going to win? Are we going to be able to significantly elevate our collective consciousness to the point that we can combat 
uh, you know, what ails us or is the dark force going to prevail? Yeah. No, yeah, man. <laughs> you know, totally. it's Star I mean, Wars, man, yeah, that's is what the, it is. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. And actually, I was in an Ibogaine experience with a buddy. Um, and Ibogaine is, um, has great promise for opiate addiction in particular. It's, it's this really powerful African root mm-hmm. um, princi- uh, psychedelic. And in uh, Black Panther, they kind of allude to um, allude to it a little bit. The medicine in that movie that, that where you hit the ancestral plane and that's and, not uh, ayahuasca. No, it's an iboga. So uh-huh. iboga, iboga. So okay. it's another, arguably even even more intense uh, plant psychedelic ally. And but it, within this vision, I had like I saw my granddad over here and in like the planet Earth and all the life artists and activists fighting the machine and Trump and all the you know are we gonna win and and you know feeling like forces uh, other dimensional forces plugging in to help you know from who knows what uh-huh. and um, and then at a certain point golden light like breaks out on the Earth and you know it was you know kind and of peace on was Earth beautiful packs, packs and beautiful and. <laughs> So I don't All right, know, well, I will adopt, yeah. I will yeah. hold that energy <laughs> frequency for the future of humanity and the yeah. planet, man. Yeah, hopefully, man. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I think that's a good place to close it down, dude. Yeah. How do well, you feel? Right on. Yeah, I think so. That yeah. was awesome, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I love that, dude. Thank you. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, I would say, I say with, with, um, a fair amount of certitude that after listening to this podcast, when you go to the store and you see that Dr. Bronner soap, you're going to you're going to look at it differently for the rest of your life after hearing this conversation. You're mm. always going to think back to, <laughs> to what we talked about Whoa, today. What? Yeah. Dude, right? that's even crazier than I thought. I know, man. So, uh, <laughs> what's 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 uh what's up with you? Like do you do you ever like um I always like to close it down like with people connect with your message. Is there how do they best connect with you? Do you ever do public talks? I know you go to Washington and you do protests and all this activist stuff. If somebody yeah. wants to get on your wavelength, like what's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I could give out my email. Um, Ooh, careful. But, oh, I know sure I do that? No, I don't know. I don't know if you oh, should yeah. do that, dude. Oh, the legendary Rich Roll <laughs> I don't know. You, fan you weirdos. Might, you might no. get a few emails, that's all. <laughs> No, 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 from that, nice that. people. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, um, yeah um, well, I am often, I guess, speaking at different regenerative organic farming conferences uh-huh. and cannabis. We're launching um, uh, Brother David's, or I should be very clear, this has nothing to do with Dr. Bronner's, my family, but Brother David's uh, regenerative cannabis flower line and be hitting a lot of the cannabis trade shows. Um, and that's to promote the small family farmed, outdoor, correctly grown uh, medicine and it's a nonprofit venture, totally all profits back to benefit, uh, you yeah. know, not because like cannabis, unfortunately, there's these huge corporate indoor grows that are dominating very energy and chemical intensive. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm out and about at different yeah. trade shows and talking. And um, But you can call up the number on Dr. Bronner's and you can totally reach me by email. I won't give out my personal oh, really? One. But yeah, like so if somebody's doctor, determined to get in touch with oh, you, it's absolutely. not that hard. No, okay. I will totally personally yeah. answer any any sincere, sweet note. And yeah. and and here's something. Even I think, if it's not sweet, if it's got good points. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> so you could do that. Uh, and as a final kind of thing, um, as a takeaway for people that are listening to this, uh, I feel like even if you're the most well-intentioned and fairly adequately informed consumer, when you go to the grocery store, the market, whatever, um, you see all of these labels on various products and it's confusing yeah. for the most intelligent among us. Like, what do these labels really mean? Does organic really mean what I think it means? What does cage-free mean? What does grass-fed mean? Does that really mean that these cows are having amazing lives? There's so many labels. And I know for myself, I've lost confidence in um, – Mm. In in the idea that, you know, they actually live up to the sort of, you know, yeah. promise. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know in many ways they don't, uh, but you're somebody who's really looked at this. So for somebody who is listening to this, like what are the labels they really need to to pay attention to? And what should they know about like truth versus fiction when it comes to these things? Yeah. Well, and you alluded to some of our litigation. I mean, we did litigate 
um, against a lot of what we called organic cheater brands in the personal care space. That, right. Like, the, yeah, because yeah. that it had been so commodified and watered down. That yeah. It and it was mean anything anymore. You yeah. could buy your way into it, essentially. Totally. Um, so the more, uh, I would say, meaningful certifications. Well, first and foremost is regenerative organic certified. It's not yet in the market. We're mm-hmm. in our pilot phase this year. But if you go to re- regenorganic.com, um, you can kind of learn more about what the standard is. Um, Do they have a list of products there that adhere to that well, standard? Well, unfortunately, there's not yet at this point okay. in the market, but you can get on the mailing list. And uh-huh. and, and then, um, but what we did with Regen Organic is take, okay, the, what are the top animal welfare pasture-based standards? So that would be your GAP4, so Global Animal Partnership. That's got that ranking in Whole Foods. So one, two, right. three are pretty m- not super meaningful but at gap four that's when it gets pretty meaningful uh-huh. so if we're, if you are going to choose eat meat or or dairy um look for gap four or, or above um and then animal welfare approved is, is pretty much the highest animal welfare certification um certified humane pasture certified humane in and of itself is a little not as strong but if it, if there's a pasture claim with certified humane certification that's pretty meaningful um, on the fair labor side, um, fair for life, that's our certifier. Um, we're, we believe that's got a lot fair of integrity. For life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fair for life. Um, and you know, there's other, fair that labors. ensures fair wages, adequate working conditions. Yeah. Gender equity. And, okay. and, um, uh, 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 we actually pay into a fair trade fund on materials and labor that helps with community de- development projects. So sanit sanitation, like clean water wells or, school books for kids or yeah. defibrillator for the hospital. And so, the, so fair trade certification is good. And, um, I mean the big, the big one here is fair trade USA and I have my issues there, but you know, there's a lot of really good products and brands uh, certified by them. And then on soil health, um, you know, obviously biodynamic and Demeter is really good. And organic, USD organic, I mean, you just got to know your brand. Yeah. You know, there's a big spectrum in there. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do with regenerative organic. It's just really, here's your single trustworthy seal mm-hmm. that on all these ones you can just trust. And what are the what are the barriers that you're facing in terms of just adoption? Um, well, it's going to be obviously consumer education um, and breaking through all the noise. Um, but we have partners like Patagonia, and I think um, – We've got a good list roster of brands, um, and I think ultimately you got to kind of do your research on a given brand. Uh-huh. But um, you know, like the Gua, like Guayaquil is a big ally for us, and they, they do the yerba, yerba mate. mate. Yeah, and you know, and that's like do do you research them? You're like, wow, this couldn't be more awesome, you know. And they're uh-huh. they're helping preserve rainforest and supporting the Guayaquil tribe, and um, and that that yeah. certification could apply to cotton garments and the like right yeah and so patagonia's um got some pretty good stuff um you know they're similar in that they've got you know certified cotton certified rubber for their wetsuits um Uh they're they're doing some really deep work into their supply chains um and i think that's part of what is is knowing the brands and and you can see in our pilot like we do have guayaki and numi and Uh some really good brands that are really going that extra mile. And I would say that, yeah, certification is, um, is, um, is good to look for, but ultimately you need to do your research on the brand and yeah. just figure out, you know, really get a feel for them. Right. And like, how committed are they? Like, is it okay? They got like a, one or two fair trade products, but the rest of their portfolio or product or brand portfolios like mm-hmm. weak, um, versus complete commitment. You know? How do you know when you're looking at these products and trying to evaluate them when you're getting fucked with? Because I'm sure there's a lot of marketing double speak and obfuscation. You know, yeah. trying to make people think that they're buying something that is oh yeah man you know, environmentally um, you know comports with all the things you're talking about, but doesn't actually. Yeah, I mean, reading an ingredient index um, is is key, and you know, simple language you can pronounce on a cosmetic obviously if you can't pronounce it it's probably doesn't yeah. belong on your skin um and uh you know obviously that'll contradict whatever green claims are being made if you're like uh, what's this seven syllable chemical name uh-huh. you know and it's like well yeah that's that's a big flag <laughs> probably yeah 
Yeah. Well, I think there's this sense that that if you're buying something at the store, that it must be fine. You right. know? Um, I'm friends with uh, this woman, Greg Renfrew, who has a company called Beauty Counter. She created this basically this gigantic company, uh, cosmetics company, initially for women um, with beauty products that are all like legitimately all natural without all the chemicals yeah. because she was horrified to discover that all these products that she thought were natural, you know, quote unquote natural really weren't. Yeah. Were no, there's no regular toxins. Yeah. Cause you just think like, well, it must be okay. I got it at the nice, that the Sephora or whatever. Right. And you realize like, yeah, it's very far from the case. Oh yeah. And there's no regulation. The onus is on you as the consumer to really be educated about these things. Yeah. It's, Buyer beware, basically, and in, in that, but yeah, reading an ingredient deck, if you, you know, it should look like a food, like you're, you're putting food on your skin and if it reads different, then that's, yeah. that's the a biggest, problem. The biggest organ on your body, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what's your favorite use of, of your product other than as, you know, a typical soap? Well, like well, of, of all the uses, well, firefighting that you foam, well, yeah, blasting foam, and people. <laughs> so, what spaces. do I have to do to get the foam truck to come to my house? Oh, no. Nah, well, next time we're around, we'll just come yeah. by and do it. All right. Yeah, you know, throw a really big party. <laughs> okay, and, good, <laughs> cool, man. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next time you have some big initiative or some something going on, come back and talk to me, man. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, right on. Thank you for having me, and this has been awesome. I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing. And I think it, it's, it's proof that you can run a company with this higher sense of purpose <clears throat> and this call to service uh, and do it in a financially, not just viable way, but in a profitable way. The, the, the manner in which you have grown this company to prominence is, I mean, they should be teaching this at Harvard Business School. It's incredible what you guys have built, and you've done it on principle with integrity, and that's to be commended. And I hope more companies out there can model their DNA off, you know, what you guys have established and created. Yeah, right on. Thank you. And yeah, and there are other companies that have inspired us, you know, like the Guad Keys of the world. Uh -huh. And yeah, and hopefully it's a virtuous cycle and others will in turn be inspired. Yeah, so. man. Yeah. It's the all one vision, brother. Bam. Unity Bam. of love. Yeah, all right, man. man. Peace. Peace. Let's. Bam. Bam.